Somebody remind me, because I'm right-handed. I should have thought this through a little bit more. You ready? I don't know. Hey, you ready? Is that a thumbs up? Okay. Thumbs up. <laughs> is that a thumbs okay. up or a... <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> So this is, this is Valerie Thomas. Uh, Valerie's bio got cut off, so it, it, it's a little cryptic, but I think it's pretty cool anyway this way, so I think you should run with it. Um, security consultant, hacker, author, DEF CON trainer, public speaker, social engineering specialist, and proud mom. Scary to some, but fascinating to others. That's literally what we have. So yeah, I don't know what happened what, there. That's what happens when you don't submit your bio on time. They just pull it from Twitter and hope that it's not too embarrassing. So take it from me. You should submit your bio on time when they say, I need this by this date. Well, I didn't think they were serious. <laughs> All right, so Dave stole the other part of the clicker, like the actual part that goes into the USB part. So uh, I'm going to try to stay fairly stationary, which is a little difficult for me, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best. So today... Uh, we'll talk a little bit about me, but not too much, because I realize that we are running behind, and I am the only thing standing between you and free lunch. So, uh, you know, my countdown's over here, I'm very aware. I'll do my best. So, uh, along with my fascinating Twitter bio, uh, I do a lot of different things. So, um, I'm the technical director for the consulting services section of a company called SecureCon. And we're based out of the Alexandria, Virginia area. So that means we do a lot of interesting things in a lot of interesting spaces. So luckily, not all of my time is spent on government sites. Um, I have a varied work wardrobe. Uh, we do a lot in ICS and critical infrastructure. Uh-oh, what's wrong? Oh, the other part of the clicker, thank you. So uh, I have a collection of hard hats and all of my PPE gear. Now this is probably not gonna work. Um, but the other really nice part of that is that it also gives me a really good uh, exposure to a lot of things. So if I'm not at a government site or a power plant, oh, it works, awesome, okay. Um, we do a lot of commercial stuff as well. So in and out of banks, insurance companies, pause for the camera. Okay. Um, so the cool thing about that is, A, I don't get bored. B, I see a lot of different things. Uh, and that means that I can sort of compile some of my, we'll call them most common misunderstandings in the physical and cybersecurity convergence world and bring them to you all. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Um, but in order to kind of lay the groundwork for that, um, these are two sort of very different worlds. So I have to, to talk a little bit about stuff that's gonna make physical security people bored, and then a little bit about what's gonna make IT security people bored. Do we have any physical security folks here today? Okay, a couple hand hands, okay. Um, are you access control people or are you more other stuff? They're like, oh, we're not telling you. That's fine, okay, it's all right, it's okay. I won't out you, all good. Um, for us IT folks and how I personally got into figuring out physical access control, um, I started finding these, these devices on the network during penetration tests and audits and things. And if you don't know what these pieces are, they look really weird. So I'm like, guys, what is this? This is, I don't, I don't know this vendor name. The web interface is awful. Well, what is this? So after hunting it down, they're like, oh, that controls all of the doors, whether they're allowed to open or close. Don't touch that. I'm like, okay, but anybody on the network can touch this. This is bad. They're like, y y yeah, yeah, don't touch that. So, um, over the years, uh, a lot of this technology on the physical access control side has become not just network enabled, but network enhanced, let's call it. No, I don't write marketing material, but maybe I could moonlight. Um, but the problem with a lot of this stuff is that it grew at a time where cybersecurity really wasn't brought into the loop. So it's on the network, but 
it's really sort of like we don't talk about that and we just pretend like it's all good. Sort of like how ICS and SCADA was about 10 years ago. Nobody was really talking about it. It had a lot of technologies that weren't implemented very well, but since like nobody was really thinking about it, like everything was fine. So that's sort of where we are today with physical access controls, except for they're a lot more connected than, than SCADA and ICS. So we gotta go through how some of these work. And that sort of starts with talking about culture. Now, there's a big divide here um, on people's perception of physical security versus cybersecurity. And when we think about it, if we look at our first part here, what are we all doing? We're protecting valuable assets. We're protecting the same valuable assets, the same ones, okay? So if I tell somebody, that I work in IT security, you get the, oh, well, you have this chain of command, and you know you must be really smart. Like, you're a computer person, that's awesome. Yeah, but if I work in physical security, I have a different chain of command that's very disjointed from IT, and then I get the, oh, are you going to school? You know, like, why are you, why are you patrolling fences? But it's so much more than that, so it's very misunderstood. Um, there's also a big difference in when these controls are put in. So when we install access control systems, that's usually like an electrical integrator, not usually a direct vendor. So it's like a Siemens or um, Data Access. Like there, there are a couple names that they basically buy the parts, they do the bid, and then they install, right? And once everything is talking to each other, the door is open when they're supposed to, they're done, out. That, that's, that's their part of the contract. But when we on the IT side, if we're going to install something like a new Oracle database, you know, it's a very long, methodical, hopefully uh, laid out process. And that integrator, that vendor is very much baked into not only the installation, but the feed and care of that system afterwards from a security perspective. And that, that's not really quite there in physical access. The other thing is usually once these systems are installed, like that's it, like we don't touch it. It's working, leave it alone. And it stays like that for the next 15 to 20 years because that's the rough life cycle of one of these systems. But on the IT side, we're like, hey, Patch Tuesday, come on. You know, we got, we got this hot fix, we got this, we gotta push that, you know, that baseline changes all the time. But on the physical access control side and some of the supporting systems, that stuff doesn't change a whole lot. Like they're not accustomed to having to push fixes and security patches, a lot like ICS and SCADA um, used to be. So we already sort of have a very large divide just based on how our environments have been treated historically. But we kind of got to converge these together because uh, a lot of these pieces are, are very smart. Um, and they are far more connected than we think. Um, I think I've went through most of this already. You know, when you're specializing in physical security, you learn a lot of things about um, force control, about access controls. When it comes to the physical side, you know, barriers and bollards and fences and fire code and and things like that. And they don't really teach you about here are the IT or networking basics that you need for your system to function properly. So we, we end up with a disconnect there. And I'll, um, I'll touch on a couple examples of that later on once I lay out some of the basics. So how these little credentials are read. So normally when we think credential, we think access card, right? The badge that most of you wear around and forget to take off when you leave the building and all of that. Um, but credential is sort of the overarching kind of catch-all term for that. That could be one of those little fobs, fob tags that you have for like the gym or a parking garage. Uh, could be mobile, right? There are some, some credentials that are mobile now that are on the phone. Uh, could be one of the tags in the car. So we have a lot of options. So credential is just sort of the catch-all of that. Sometimes I'll slip and use card interchangeably, but just keep in mind that these are not always the little plastic PVC cards that we're talking about. So the credential, in the case of the fobs and the cards, has a small little chip inside of it, and it doesn't have a battery, right? That's why the cards are pretty light. So the chip inside has the information stored on it, but it doesn't do anything until it gets power, and it gets power from the reader within proximity, 
So when you hold the card up, the reader will give power to it. And the chips, the lower level ones, will just scream out like toddlers. Hi, I'm Bobby. Hi, I'm Bobby. Hi, I'm Bobby. Until it loses power. And then when it gets power, it repeats. Bless you. Um, so this data uh, is sent. Ooh, let me see if I can use the pointer without messing this up. Ooh, no, no, I can't. OK. Uh, so this data uh, goes from our credential to our reader here. Our reader on the back side is actually wired with copper. So there are between, there's a minimum of four copper wires, up to 12, I think, in that, that twisted cable there, um, into this thing called a controller, our little green thing at the top. And our controller is sort of like our, our bouncer. It's our doorman. It has the list. So the credential is sent via copper to our door controller, or sometimes they're called net controllers, depending on your vendor. And it checks the list and it says, oh, OK, you're on the list. And then it goes beep. And the light turns green, and the door unlocks, and life is good. Or if you're not on the list, or you're, not, you're on the list, but it's not the right time, you might get a really loud, long, angry beep, or no response at all. So our doorman gets his, uh, his list from the server, which is down here on the bottom. Um, my Adobe Illustrator skills are not very good, so sorry. It's the best I could do, and at least it's not paint. Um, but our server connects to our, our door controller via Ethernet. So those door controllers are very not intelligent computers. Um, like Raspberry Pis are more powerful than most of these. But uh, a lot of them are, are very old technology, right? So when we, and we've connected these to the network, mind you, the corporate network, and they're probably not segmented properly. So you can see where I'm starting to go with this. Uh, door controllers usually handle between 4 to 12 inputs, depending on how many little pieces you add on to this. So think of this as like a server environment where it's tiered. So you have several of these, and then they report to other controllers and other controllers in the server, right? So some environments have 20 to 30 of these controllers. Some of environments, if you're across several um, Warehouses, you know, if you're in a complex, we could have a couple hundred of these controllers. And then you have places like Amazon, who has so many that they're actually a reseller. They're, they're not even a client anymore uh, because they just couldn't keep up. <laughs> but our problem here is that a lot of different people are responsible for a lot of different pieces of how this system works. So we've got physical security, and their job is usually to manage our credentials or our card stock, hand out the cards, keep track of them, register them in the server. Uh, our card readers and our door controllers and that copper wire in between, that's usually a, an integrator, a vendor integrator thing. Um, and then we've got the Ethernet connection, just that little, little cable right there, bloop between the controller and the server. So you got corporate network guys for that. And then corporate IT, you know, usually the server is like in a server farm somewhere in a large environment. In small environments, it's under so-and-so's desk. Um, literally, under so-and-so's desk. Um, <laughs> mileage may vary. So we can already see from our lines of responsibility here, how a lot of things that should be checked on and feed and care security-wise are probably going to get missed. This leaves a lot of gray area between kingdoms. And as a red teamer, uh, I'm really good at finding those little holes and just, it's like reverse Jenga. Like I'm really good at finding that block to just push the right way to make it all come crumbling down. So we're going to talk a little bit about ways to do that so that you can start to talk with the folks in your environment, uh, talk to your physical security folks about, hey, you know, I think we should probably look into um, tightening up that environment a little bit on the network side. Um, I only have an hour, so we're not going to go through these in great detail. Oh, that is driving me crazy. Sorry, guys. OK. but. Uh, the cards are usually, our credentials are the most discussed, right? That's usually where you see most of the, the DEF CON talks and the hacking talks are all about cards and card cloning and, and whatnot. We'll touch on it lightly, but I want to talk about some of the other stuff that's not as popular. But just so that you kind of have an idea that there are different kinds of cards out there in the credential world. So the low frequency is called proximity. Uh, this is the most common. It is the cheapest. 
you'll find these in uh, shopping centers and fitness clubs, uh, multi-tenant buildings, like lower end multi-tenant buildings, usually just a regular proximity system. Um, the content on these cards is not encrypted. All right. For those of you who are uh, signal people, 125 kilohertz is really slow. All right, we can't send a lot of information on that wave and wait for it to come back. So in comes the high frequency cards, the new sexy, right? The new sexy, 13.56 megahertz. That's, that's a lot faster, awesome. More than 10 times faster, we can send a lot of data. We can do encryption now if we choose to do so. Uh, we, can, we can do a lot of things. Uh, these cards are more expensive and they are slower once you start adding things to go on that channel. So although it travels faster physically, uh, it could actually be a lot slower than proximity. And then we've got multi-frequency here. And these are made for uh, large installations or large companies that are looking to transition. So if we have a, a proximity, a low frequency system, and we want to start using something that has uh, encryption at the endpoint, and we want something that's more sophisticated, that's great. Um, but if you have hundreds to thousands of card readers on doors and access points everywhere, you can't just roll this out overnight like a, like a Microsoft patch. Right, you literally have to go and rip the reader out of the wall and redo the wiring and redo all, you know, you'll probably need new controllers. So on the hardware side, this takes quite a while. And sometimes you'll have one building that's on the old cards and one building that's on the new and multi-buildings, you know, if you have remote offices that use the same card system, then you've got to get to them. So that's why there are multi-frequency badges. And um, so that both will work until you've completely transitioned to your, high, to your higher level of security, and then you disable the proximity part. Let me say it again. We disable the proximity part when we're done. This gets forgotten a lot. So um, we talked about those panels on the cards a little bit, right? And our card sends two pieces of data to that panel. It sends our facility code, which is usually the same for everybody. Uh, and it sends our card number. And that's our number that makes it unique. That's how the doorman knows that it's, it's me requesting access as opposed to somebody else. Now, if you just glance at our numbers here, they're sort of sprinkled into the bitstream. So there are numbers around it, and it's kind of padded. Now, as a security person, you look at that and you're like, oh, yeah, that's for security. That's, that's good. That's a good idea, right? Actually, this isn't for security at all. Uh, the vendors do this so that they can lock you into buying custom formatting from them so that you can't buy cardstock or credentials from anybody else. It is literally an accidental security through obscurity step. However, um, while that may have worked 20, 30 years ago, we have a lot more technology now, and it's a lot faster for us to brute force and figure out uh, what that formatting looks like on the computing side. So um, unfortunately, this is not a real security feature. Uh, and we help clients all the time who are stuck paying an outrageous amount of money for these formats from these vendors. And I'm like, oh no, that, that just check it out. Look here. I got this. We got these on eBay, this whole box. And if you use this tool this way, you can write your own. So we do a little streamlining with the process along with the security assessments. Uh, if we're going to steal some card data, you know, I touched on this, I think, a couple of years ago when I spoke. So we're, we're not going to go into too much detail here. There are a bunch of really great designs for uh, long-range card readers that will basically just read the card data and save it all in a micro SD. Um, the reader itself is about a foot square, give or take. It's meant for like a parking garage. Uh, it has a rough, or it's about one foot square, I'm sorry. And it has about a three foot read range in the absolute best condition. So that really means about two feet. but. Two feet away from somebody, if I have this in a messenger bag, is pretty easy for me to do as an attacker. I just put it in the bag and I'll walk around, especially at lunchtime, especially in places like larger cities where everybody is sort of crammed together. It's very easy to just collect the credentials and let it save to the micro SD. 
Now, depending on what kind of card system you're using and what kind of uh, readers, they have encryption. That's okay. Uh, I can buy some of those readers and it decrypts for me. And because we're taking the data after it has gone through the decryption process, I now have the unencrypted card data saved and then I can just rewrite using the encryption key. Uh, I make that sound really, really easy. It's a couple hours of work, but it can be done fairly easily if, if you're dedicated enough. So that card data looks like this when it's saved on that micro SD. So we literally, when we're attacking a target, we'll just go and walk around and around and around and we'll find the hot spots. Um, whether that's the coffee shop, the gas station, uh, the one lunch joint in the small town, it really sort of depends on the client and like where we are. But it's pretty easy to find a large group of people who work for a company because they're wearing a bunch of the company swag or they're wearing their badge to where we can see it. So, um, words of caution about cards, right? They are clonable, it is pretty easy to do. Um, the tools are getting a lot cheaper now, so this is becoming more and more of a viable threat. Let's talk about the readers, because these attacks are less common, and I want you to understand a little bit about how they work. So the readers, the little box in the wall, if you kind of yank on that box a little bit, um, you can pop the top off of it, and then you'll see the copper wire that's in there, right? So um, those copper wires, like we mentioned before, the card data goes between the reader and the door controller. So if we just put something in between, we can man in the middle just like we do on the network, except for now it's on this wire side instead. Um, so this little tool, the ESP key, uh, I think it's from redteamtools.com. Uh, this will run you about $100. Uh, and he's literally the size of a postage stamp. And that's what it looks like when it's punched down. You only need four wires for this one. Uh, and it saves everything to micro SD, but it also has Wi-Fi in it. So you can actually just connect to it when you're close enough or if you've got some extenders out, if you're doing some, some fun red team things. And it records and saves everything, but if you go to the web interface, you can just like browse and then you can select one and just replay it whenever you want. So if my team member doesn't actually have a card, like a physical card, that's okay. I can just wait till they get to the door, replay it, and then open the door for them. A uh, little scary. Uh, they, these will also work in their own little hive network. So if you install them in various doors, you know, you can, um, put them all on the same Wi-Fi network, and then you can sit in the parking lot um, or across the street, or as long as you've got Wi-Fi. Or if we're going to get fancy and put cellular on it, um, you can sit anywhere and just open the doors whenever you want. Okay, that's a little cool. I, I, I can work with that. All of the attacks that we do for these kinds of systems are not all high-tech. Um, I had mentioned earlier we need two pieces of information from that card. Right, the facility code, which is not written on the card, but the card number is actually printed on the card. So uh, on the bottom here, 60347 is our card number. So this is the IT equivalent of writing a password on your forehead that you can never change. This is a problem. Um, we will often do social engineering calls and get people to read those numbers to us off the bottom of the badge. And then I already have a good idea about if there's a little logo at the bottom. Now I know where to start. Uh, I know where to lo start looking into the formatting. So sometimes it's not even really technically difficult to do this. They print them on the boxes too um, for the cardstock. So if you can impersonate a vendor or trick somebody in the uh, physical security office into reading you the, the information off the box, uh, you can get the same amount of information. And then you know where they buy them from, which is great, because you can just make your own. Request to exit devices. These are cool. Uh, I like these a lot, that little white box there. Uh, they're designed to um, either just release the alarm mechanism or release the lock on the door, because people are lazy and they don't like having to push that exit button or scan their badge when they want to leave an area. So they put these motion detectors in to, to do the click-click, you hear the click click when you get close to the door and it unlocks so that you don't have to be bothered to, to hit the button. Because we're busy people. You know, we, we don't have time to do that. 
Um, it's cool because you can play with them from the outside of the door, especially if there's like a crack in between the two doors like this, or at the bottom. This is actually from a federal data center. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know why they did that, but it's probably still like that. So, uh, very sophisticated technology, yes. Coat hanger. I love the we love our customers. You unfold it, you make a little flag, you slide it between the two doors and you wave the flag and it will activate the motion sensor and pop open the door. Um, if that doesn't work, that beam can be adjusted like farther out so jerks like me can't stand on the other side of the door and open it with a flag. So I use the, the balloons from the balloon animals and like the little travel pump for the kids' parties. So you put the balloon through, you blow it up, and then you let it go. So the balloon goes like this. And if you're lucky, you get it the first or second time and it will click and open the door. If you were unlucky, there is a bunch of balloons on the inside that you can't get to. <laughs> so then you gotta find another way. But this is a physical access control system talk, not a physical pen testing talk, so we're not gonna talk about those other ways right now. Door controllers. I keep picking on these things, and for a good reason. Um, they're easy to find. They are often just chilling on the network. Um, they have really stupid things open on them. But here's the problem. When you scan with your vulnerability scanner of choice, and I haven't found one yet that properly identifies any of these, right? So it's not like, a, oh, this vendor's better than this vendor. No, like nobody, to my knowledge, do you guys probably, okay. Nobody to my knowledge properly identifies these. I had to just double check. Um, so when you scan it with Nessus or Nexpos or whatever, it comes up with like four or five infos and like those really stupid, not helpful ones. It's like, oh, this is a general purpose device. Because they're crappy generic devices and that's what they show up as, crappy generic devices. But they're useful crappy generic devices. Like they're a gold mine to the right person. So um, on the IT side, this is why this kind of stuff often hides. Um, it, sometimes the SNMP agent on them is just like weird enough to where like a vulnerability scanner won't pick it up because it's, it's not quite the same as the SNMP that you'll see on other network devices. So uh, you need to start looking for these in your scans. Um, the problem with uh, a lot of the areas of responsibility is that when the physical security system owner is given the checklist of what to get ready before the vendor comes in, they'll say, hey, I need a VLAN um, a, as they're reading off the checklist. Now remember, this is not their wheelhouse, all right? This is, this is how we have a gap, right? This is not their wheelhouse. They should be having help in this process. Goes to the network guy, he's like, hey, I need a slash 24 VLAN. Yeah, network guy's like, awesome, here you go. Now, what didn't happen there was nobody from security came in and said, hey, wait, we need to put access control on that VLAN. So now we've got a routable VLAN, and these things are literally just hanging out on the network. Physical security system owner is like, hey, I got a VLAN. I'm good, right? Like, you can't get to that. It's on a VLAN. But we can because nobody knew that we needed to tell the network guy, hey, these are the controls you need to put around it. So we have a lot of like very small disconnects uh, in this space, and that adds up to really big problems if somebody like me gets into there. Uh, same thing with cameras. Cameras are usually on their own VLAN, or sometimes they'll ride another VLAN with another similar device. Routable. Uh, I mean, you all have seen the showdown filters for cameras, right? I mean, these things are everywhere. Everywhere. Um, the other problem with cameras is, uh, well, there's, there's several, but one of my favorites is I, I like to hide my evil files on them because nobody's doing endpoint protection on their cameras. So if I have evil files that I know are going to trip certain, certain uh, signatures on the network, I'll just hide them on something like this. They have a little bit of storage space since they have to be able to store all of the uh, video. The server. The server is a little harder to find as a red team person unless you're following a DNS naming convention. Then it's very easy. Please, please, please stop naming your servers accesscontrol.whatever at domain.com. Don't use the vendor name. Do not name it secure9000.company.com. Okay, this, this is very easy uh, for people like me to find it. 
Now, if you want to practice and you don't want to buy your own, that's fine. Um, you can just keyword search on Showdown and find several of these that are connected to the internet, um, probably not on purpose. Um, yeah, but I'm sure that's fine. Uh, once we've got server access, we can do lots of great stuff, right? So once we've got access to the server and the software on it, it's very much like Active Directory, right? So if we think of, of groups of users that have access to certain areas at certain times of the day, right? Same thing in physical access control, um, except for it's a little, little easier uh, to just click and drag a bunch of users and remove them from a group. Uh, that doesn't really sound very exciting until you think about it in an evil way, which is sort of my specialty. Um, you know, ransomware is like the big thing, right? Everybody's, you know, ransomware this, and it's taking out cities, and it's taking out companies that should have backups and that should know better. Um, and this is IT stuff. These are patches that we've been fighting for years, yes? Yes. Somebody is nodding and agreeing with me out there. I'm sure you are. I just can't see you. Um, what about on the flip side? What about if we compromise a physical access control system and start taking other things ransom? Like, I don't know, a little of this and a little of that. This scenario is far more complicated than it needs to be, but um, I was presenting this to an ICS audience a couple of months ago, so I made it look sort of, you know, semi-formal, but really we could probably just go from attacker to workstation to admin access. But I put a few more steps in there to maybe take a, a little bit more time. Um, and we've done this type of attack before, uh, where we did get into a workstation and that user was not an admin, so we had to find the admins of the system, which was pretty easy, uh, and then target them. And then we had admin access to the software in the system. And then, we started moving people around in those groups we were talking about, right? So, I mean, this is all fun and good and we're having a good time until it gets to the point where, oh, oh, remember those groups? So if I really wanted to be a jerk and if I really wanted to make money, like forget workstations. No, 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 no. We're, we're gonna remove everybody from the group for the access to the buildings. We're going to cause an emergency where the building has to be evacuated, which is not difficult. Put your mind to it. And then we're going to push that update. And then we're going to hold your building for ransom. Oh, yeah. Okay, good times. Um, I, I think I'm going to call it locked out of heaven, right, because uh, no good vulnerability is uh, famous anymore without a name and a logo. So I'm still working on the logo, but... Uh, I think that once once people figure out that oh wait this is this can be done really easily um, and we can get way more money for this than we can for uh, a few systems here and there I, I think it'll be a new threat of ransomware pretty soon. How else would we get some access to that that workstation that the guard uses all the time? Why not just target the guard that uses it all the time, right? Um, Please train your physical security people to stop advertising that they worked armed physical security at blah blah substation or at blah blah building. Uh, this was for a federal contractor uh, recently, actually, and um, they contract out through a third party guard service. Okay, that's fine. There, are, there aren't that many. You can search those contracts and figure out which one it is, or you can drive by and look at their uniforms to see what the patch is on the side. Um, and from there, it's easy, right? So LinkedIn is the phone book for social engineers and forever will be. If I want to know who works security at this building, I just go look it up on LinkedIn. I'll get some hits, and then the LinkedIn algorithm will do the rest of the finding for me. Um, we created a fictitious federal discount sales program for federal employees and contractors for 511. I still haven't got the takedown notice from that domain, so that's kind of cool. Still have it. Um, and we went through the whole deal, right? And we're not talking about like lame phishing with, you know, misspelled words and stuff. No, no, no. We don't fish with email. We fish with Messenger and LinkedIn. Because why worry about the email controls when you can just bypass them? So this is a pretty effective way to target the right people 
The risk is pretty low. Uh, if you've done your homework on the IT side, you already know what kind of antivirus they're running and what kind of controls they have in place. I only need to send three or four of these messages before I get the hit that I need. And if I know who's working on shift work, which is really not hard, um, those guys get super bored. <laughs> and for whatever reason, they love Instagram. So um, if I send those when like a second shift or like the third shift guy is on, he's just trying to stay awake. He's going to look. He's going to click. So um, I'm going to get my access, and I'm going to get it at a time where there's probably not a good network response team in place. So even if it just happens to trigger something, I'm still going to have enough time to do what I need to do and get out and cover my tracks before anybody's the wiser. So wow, that was kind of heavy. Um, what should we do about that? Uh, a lot of stuff. So. Most of this stuff is very easy, basic IT stuff that is preventable. Uh, it's just finding the needle in the needle stack of the environment. Um, if it's not documented very well, um, if the integrator didn't, didn't leave a good list of this is the inventory list, this is the IP, this is the location, it, it could take you a few weeks to, um, to literally walk around and find everything if you can't find it on the network. Um, a lot of these pieces of equipment, especially those door controllers, are pretty fragile. So, like, this is not the time to just blast out a bunch of packets to try to find them. Uh, it's, it's like the umbrella and the fainting goats at some time, at some point. You just, they all fall over. And when the door controllers stop working, the door gets unlocked. So, that's bad. Uh, clients do not like it um, when you light up a port scanner uh, and knock out all of their door control because uh, then they have to go put guards everywhere until we can figure out how to get those back up and running. So hunt with caution. Um, if you do not understand how these systems work, don't go just looking around for them uh, aggressively. Look through the stuff that you already have because if you're already doing vulnerability scans, it's probably in there already. Um, look for some keywords. I can get you a list. Uh, look for some weird ports, I can get you a list. Um, attack surfaces, we need to lock them down, we talked about that. Educating credential protection is another important one. Um, badges, right? Stop, stop wearing the badges outside of the building, stop leaving them places and so on. Um, the RFID blocking card holders uh, are marginally effective. Um, the best one I found so far uh, is from a company called ID Stronghold. That's what these ones are here. Um, they will reduce the distance that you need to be as close to them to read the card. It won't completely eliminate it, but it will reduce the distance to where I have to be a lot more aggressive to collect that, that card data um, without actually bumping into them. So they're not perfect, but they will drastically reduce. Uh, they also have the armbands for people who work in um, places like manufacturing, uh, utilities who can't have the lanyard around their neck, uh, airports, right? Uh, stuff like that, people who work on the flight line. These work pretty well as, as well. Um, the, the staff education, that was a big one. Uh, we have lumped everybody together. Everybody takes the same awareness training that we just click through and ignore. It hasn't changed in 10 years. We know exactly where to click and how to answer the four questions to get our certificate at the end. Um, nobody is, is focusing in on teaching system owners and users of specific systems that value very well yet, especially physical. So look at your awareness program and start to tailor that to the physical side. Um, because they, ha they are sitting on a gold mine of access every day and they're surfing the internet and they probably don't even realize what it is that they, they could potentially allow to happen. Uh, a couple of years ago, SecureCon released a uh, free uh, PAX security checklist. So basically I went through and made a, a high level list of, okay, if I was gonna lock this stuff down, Here's where I'd start looking. And this is written more toward um, folks in the physical security industry. So it's, look at this, consult your network person for this, consult the security team for this. Um, but you guys could use it on the IT side as well. It'll just be a, a quick way to identify some of the attack surfaces and start to explore them on your network. Um, I have my contact information in here, so please just reach out to me and I'll get it to you. Uh, we do this as a service, um, but it kind of depends on your 
company culture, right? So sometimes it's really good, especially if like IT and physical security aren't really buddies. Um, nothing will bond them faster than somebody to mutually hate together. And I'm fine being that person, right? Like you can be mad at me, that's fine. Um, you can be mad at me all you want, we'll get it fixed. Um, but it, it does kind of take out some of the tension um, of the environment because nobody likes being told their baby is ugly. Right, and at least on the IT side, we're used to a lot of audits and people coming in and poking holes in our systems and and saying, okay, this is bad, this is bad. On the physical security side, that that hasn't really been done a whole lot, so it it's it's new territory and it's it's painful, right? Nobody really likes it, so uh, you know, it's there are third parties who can come in and kind of help get some of that tension out and still achieve the same goal. Um, caution areas, though, if you're going to look at your own here, uh, multi-technology access cards, uh, let's, let's pay attention to those. Um, the multi-technology readers are another problem. Um, there are configurations in the software where you can turn this on and off, and it's literally a checkbox. So some of my clients, they have very expensive um, card systems and they paid extra for these cards with this extra encryption and this and all these great features and they're paying like an outrageous amount of money for each card that they're issuing and then I go and I look in the server and they're not actually encrypting it because that checkbox isn't checked. I can actually tell uh, usually um, just by how quickly between the beep of when the card is read and how quickly the turnstile opens if you're actually encrypting or not because the encryption takes longer. Um, because it, the keys are bigger and it takes longer to send that data over the air. Um, so we've, we've gone into several places where that was has been misconfigured and here they thought they were using encryption and they're running in completely wide open. So um, tons of little gotchas like that. I, I've got most of them I think captured in the checklist. Uh, feel free to send me feedback on that. Um, basic stuff that we handle in IT all the time, right? Uh, third party, third party monitored access network control. Uh, sometimes there's a third party that runs the packs, and that's fine. Um, they need to use a VPN just like everybody else. Like that should not be hanging out on the internet so that the vendor can get to it. They, they can have a token. It can be a soft token, hard token, whatever. They can get on the VPN just like the rest of us can get on the VPN. Uh, network segmentation. Basic software stuff, you know, the things that we've already done in IT, we just have to kind of tune how we look at it. So I went really fast to try to make up some time so that you guys could get to lunch on time, and I think I did pretty good. I had an hour, and I only took 41 minutes and 18 seconds of it. So, right? Boom. <laughs> and everybody's awake. Awesome. Questions? Like, if you all want to go to lunch, that's fine. I'm going to hang out. If you don't want to ask questions in front of everybody, that's fine, too. Um, if you want to copy the checklist, uh, shoot me an email, ping me on Twitter, um, or the company Twitter. I run that, too. Uh, and I'll get that to you. Uh, if you want to talk more about how to integrate some of the service, I'll be happy to help. Thanks so much, guys. Enjoy the conference.